Wormwood, you have mentioned casually that the patient has continued to attend one church, and one only since he was converted, and that he is not wholly pleased with it. What are you doing? Why have I had no reports on the causes of his loyalty to this church? Do you not realize that unless it is due to indifference, it is a very bad thing? Surely you know that if a person can't be cured of church-going, the next best thing is to send them all around the city looking for the church that suits them until they become a taster or connoisseur of churches. The reasons are obvious. In the first place, the local organization should always be attacked. Being a unity of place and not of likings, it brings together people of all different classes and psychologies into the kind of unity that the enemy desires. The congregational principle, on the other hand, makes each church into a sort of club, and finally, if all goes well, into a clique or faction. In the second place, the search for a suitable church will cause your man to be a critic where the enemy wants him to be a pupil. What he wants of laymen in the church is an attitude which may indeed be critical in terms of rejecting what is false or unhelpful, but which is wholly uncritical in that it does not appraise, does not waste time in thinking about what it rejects, but lays itself open in uncommenting, humbles receptivity to any nourishment which is going on. This attitude, especially during sermons, creates a condition most hostile to our whole policy in which platitudes may become really audible to a human soul. There is hardly any sermon, or any book, which may not be dangerous to us when received in this mood. So get off your butt and send this fool on a tour of the neighboring churches as soon as possible. Your record to date has not given us much satisfaction. The two churches next nearest him I have looked up in the office. Both have certain claims. The first is a pastor who has spent so long watering down the faith for a supposedly incredulous and hard-headed congregation that it is now he who shocks his parishioners with his lack of unbelief, and not vice versa. He has undermined many a soul's Christianity. His conduct of the services is also admirable. In order to spare the laity any difficulties, he has, without noticing it, begun to run endlessly on the treadmill of his fifteen favorite psalms and twenty favorite lessons. We are thus safe from the danger that he or his congregation will be presented with any truth not already familiar to them through scripture. But perhaps your patient is not quite silly enough for this church, at least not yet. At the other church, we have Reverend Spike. The humans are often puzzled to understand the range of his opinions, how he is one day a communist and the next day almost a theocratic fascist. One day he seems like a scholar and the next denies human reason altogether. One day he seems to be immersed in politics, while the next he declares that all nations of this world are simultaneously under judgment. We of course see the connecting link, which is hatred. He cannot bring himself to preach anything which is not calculated to shock, grieve, puzzle, or humiliate his parents and their friends. A sermon which such people could accept would be to him almost as insipid as a poem they could scan. He also has a promising streak of dishonesty in him. We are teaching him to say, the teaching of the church is, when he really means, I think I recently read somewhere. But I must warn you, he does have one fatal flaw. He really believes, and this may yet ruin it all. But there is one good point which both of these churches share in common. They are both strongly denominational. I believe I warned you before that if your patient can't be kept out of the church, he ought to at least be violently attached to some party within it. I don't mean on really doctrinal issues. About those, the more lukewarm he is, the better. And it isn't the doctrines on which we chiefly depend for producing malice. The real fun is to work up hatred between those who say Mass and those who say Holy Communion, when neither party could explain the difference between, say, Hooker's Doctrine and Thomas Aquinas in any way that would hold water for more than five minutes. All the purely indifferent things. Candles and clothes and whatnot are an admirable ground for our activities. We've quite removed from their minds what that pestilent fellow Paul used to teach about food and other non-essentials, namely that the human without scruples should always give in to the human with scruples. You would think they could not fail to see the application. You would expect to see the evangelical churchman genuflecting and crossing himself, lest he lead his orthodox brother into irreverence, and the orthodox churchman refraining from these activities, lest he lead his evangelical brother into idolatry. And so it would have been, if not for our ceaseless labor. Without us, the variety of traditions within the church might have become a positive hotbed for kindness and humility. <laughs>